to receive from him. I tell you, this is special. This isn't just something that we do because we have to. This is an honor that we get to do this. This is an honor that these doors can be open and we can come into this place. We can gather in his name and we can worship him. And I thank God for that. Hallelujah. So tonight, let's stand to our feet. I know that we all have requests this, and there's names going in our hearts and our minds right now. But God sees those. So we're going to pray for those. We're going to invite the spirit into this place and we're going to worship him tonight. Oh, our precious heavenly father, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, Father God, that we are allowed to come into your house tonight, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that, Father, you have brought us here, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that, Father God, your word tells us that, Lord, we can cast our cares upon you and you would give us the rest, Lord. So tonight, Lord, we just pour out our cares to you, Lord, Father God, knowing that you are in this place. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you would touch each need, Lord, lift them up, Lord. Father God, just take that burden, Lord, as we give it unto you, Lord. Lord, we pray, Father God, Lord, that you would just reach down, touch the word tonight, Lord, the songs to be sung, Lord, each and everything that uplifts you. We pray that anointing in this place, Lord. Lord, as we can feel that spirit, Lord, already in this place. Lord, as we've been singing about you, we've been praising you, we've been talking about your holy name, Lord, and we thank you for that. So tonight, Lord, we ask you, Lord, Lord, to just touch our pastor, our singers, our musicians, Lord, each one with that need, Lord, that, Father God, they would find a closeness, Lord, in a relationship with you tonight, Lord, more than ever before. So, Lord, we thank you. We ask you to go now before us, Lord. For, Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. In your sweet name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. We got a special for you guys tonight. Sister Charlotte's going to sing for us. This song will bless you. Uh, you know, last year I was learning it. I said, oh, Lord, it will bless somebody. I just know it will. Now, not me, but, I, you know. Then COVID happened and, and life happened. So I started learning it again. But this time I related to it. And I knew I'd been there, you know. And Psalm 91 tells us, he shall call to me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. Maybe you're in a place where you feel hidden, lost, forgotten. You're not. So I hope it ministers to you. Pray for me. There's a couple high places. I may not get there, but that's okay. You are not hidden. Never been a moment you were forgotten and you are not hopeless. You have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be your shelter and I'll be your armor. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I hear 
you whisper underneath your breath. I hear you whisper you have nothing left. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true. I will rescue you. And I will never stop marching to reach you in the middle of the hardest fight. It's true. and I almost testified uh, I'm not even sure how long ago it was we had an amazing evening service we had so many great wonderful powerful moves of God in our evening services just we've just been so blessed and there was one night in particular that God just had us kind of sit still for a little bit and uh, and he reminded us that in that stillness in his presence he could do more and that in our minds, we feel like we have to move to get anything done. And it has to be in ourselves. But he said, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And I remember coming up and I came up to the altar with one thought on my mind. And I hadn't been there for more than a minute. And the Holy Spirit started having me intervene for somebody else and pray for just in the spirit. And I didn't know what was happening. And the next day... Um, the next day I figured out why but God had already spoken a word he'd already spoken a promise before that chaos ever unleashed itself and so I'm standing on the word that I got right here not what not what hit us in the face or in our in our physical it's that promise it's that word it's that song it's that melody it's the word he's so good to us he's so loving he's so good to us and so when the pastor invites you and says oh there's a there's something for you right here please don't ever walk out and and not respond if you feel the spirit of god tugging on you don't know what he wants to give you to arm you for what's ahead only god knows but he will he will prepare you Oh, we're just in this place of worship right now. We just want to bring space. We wanted to collectively create a space in this place tonight for people to just come and receive and honor and pour out before God. Pastor, you spoke such a word this morning that stirred us and it stirred our hearts. The purifying love of God that he just wants us to to, to be willing to give up some things. So so in this time and in this space, if you just want to come up and receive, you don't have to, you don't have to wait on anything. Just be the spirit of the just let the spirit of God lead you. But if you have something to surrender, don't walk through those doors carrying that same thing. We just want to worship and we're just gonna praise God. We're gonna glorify the King of Kings. Oh, we're just gonna worship. So you just don't mind us. We're not going to be in your space. We're just all creating this, this inhabitants for the Lord to be in and to dwell in. Oh, we worship you, King of Kings. Come on, choir. Yes, Lord. Well, bow down and say you are a God. Every man. Well, bow down and say you are a
just want to be with you. We just want to be with you.
repeating that you want your people prepared you want your people to look like you you want to look in the midst of our trials and our fires and you want to see you shining back with faith and trust and so God we come surrender tonight Lord forgive us for not asking more for you to take things from us forgive us God where we've come to receive only and not being willing to surrender but this is a time and a place that you've created, Lord, and that you have compelled your people to have a refining moment, a refining moment with you. God, we're here. We say yes, Lord. We say yes to more of you, God, and less of us. We want you to see you, God. We want you to see you in us, God. In the altar. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If you're looking for an offering, it's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a little sacrifice for you. You're a fire, you're a fire. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord, here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my God. The altar's where you meet us. Take me there. Take me there. If you're looking for an offering, it's right here. My life is here. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire. 
the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by the fire. Pure and fine. You take whatever you want.
only you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, so take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, so take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried. Purify, so take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Heavenly Father, that is our cry. That's a spiritual cry. Because our flesh would always want to escape those circumstances. But our spirit knows it's in those circumstances that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. It's in those fiery times that we realize who you are. And we realize what we've been fighting you over. So Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, I hope that has been the people's cry. Lord, if you're looking for an offering, here I am. Beautiful words. That God, I pray that we don't just sing. I pray that we live by. That we offer you ourselves every chance that we get to come in this building to allow you to do your perfect work. To speak your word that strengthens us. Your word that we desire for this day that we are living in. Father, for all the churches who are having service tonight, those who've joined in online, I pray right now wherever they are, they feel a peace come over them. God, I know that some of them may be watching in a place where there's chaos going all around them. Maybe their homes are going through stuff. But right now, let your presence, let there be a heavenly invasion in earthly places right now. Because heaven is not afraid to enter in where there's trouble. Because heaven knows there's one greater. So Father, let there just be an encampment of angels right now ministering angels, angels that have been assigned with the messages that you have given for each life. Father, let this word come clearly tonight. Let us hear it clearly. Let us respond to it clearly. No mistake about it. This word was meant for us tonight. Father, we take the faith that you have measured out to us and we bind any enemy. Nothing can stop us from receiving this word tonight. If anything tries to distract us, hinder us, Father, may it be captured right now so that we freely can hear from your throne room of grace and that we can get in our cars and say it was good for me to be in the house of the Lord. To take that strength into our work week and wherever you have us to go, the people that we're going to meet, as even Sister Venus said, sometimes you call us not because of what we're going through, but Father, you call us to a place like we were going through it so that when we go out to the public and people who are going through it, we will be filled with your spirit to know what to say, how to act, and how to handle it. So, Father, let it be bigger than us. Let this word that comes forth just be bigger than us. Let it be something not only that we receive, but we share. We thank you. In Jesus' holy, precious name, we all agree and we say, Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. How many think that was just a beautiful song? Never heard that song. That was the first time I ever heard that song. That one will be on the playlist. Amen. That was beautiful. Man, oh man. That was just uh, a beautiful, beautiful song. And uh, thank God for that. Amen. Be going to Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Thank you for making this an opportunity for you to come in and that we can worship God together. The title of tonight's message is The Weapon of Worry. Is there anybody in here that never worries? Good. Because if you would have said yes, you fibbing. Right? You carry flesh. Worry. Make no mistake tonight, this message is not about how to stop worry. Because we live in a world that's going to always be affecting our flesh and our, our mindset. 
but but how many know God's word will help slow it down? Amen. Now somebody may say, Lawrence, that's a crazy statement to make, but let's be honest. No matter how faithful you are, you will go through situations that you'll worry about, right? And it's a weapon of the enemy. It's a weapon to distract you. It's a weapon to make you feel unfaithful. Worry will, let me say this, worry has more questions than answers. It has more work than energy. And it always thinks about giving up. That's how you know you're truly caught in this, this trap of worry is when giving up looks like the best option. Blaming other things, blaming other situations and saying, well, I'll just not go back. I'll just not. That's when you know you're caught. How many know we're living in a time now that the picture that is painted to us is that the worst is happening? Anybody believe that? Let me say this. If there's nothing new under the sun, what we're going through has happened before. It's just they didn't have the outlets to share it. So our minds now think the worst. It was a woman in Phoenix, Arizona, very, very super hot day. Her car did not have air condition. She went to the grocery store. She put her groceries in there. She forgot something, went back, came back, sat down in the driver's seat, and all of a sudden heard, pow! And she felt something hit her head, and she, she reached back, and she felt the goo. And she called 911 and said, I've been shot because... That was the big thing. Everybody was talking about shooting, shooting, shooting. So she called 911. I've been shot. 911 shows up. Two ambulances, a fire truck. They open the door. She's holding her head. A can of biscuits had blew up and hit her in the back of the head. And when she felt that, she thought it was her brain coming out. But her mind went to the worst. You know why? Because that's what we hear. That's what we believe. And the weapon of worry has caused people to change their life. It has caused them to, to, to live in this box. And I'm not talking about pandemics. I'm just talking about worry. If you've ever had your family go through stuff, you, what you want to do is stay away from it ever again. If you've ever been broken, you want to stay away from it and you worry that it's going to happen again. You felt the pain for the first time. Let me say this. I'll never forget this. When my father passed away, I was 16 years old. When I was 18, I was 19, I was working at a, a place called Kentucky Finance in Richlands. I get a phone call. They said, your mama was in a wreck. I get in my car and I go 100 miles an hour. And the whole way I'm driving, I'm not thinking she was in a wreck. I'm thinking the worst because I'm thinking I can't do this again. I can't live like that again. So worry was constant. Who am I going to lose next? What's going to happen? So we, we live in this panic. And this is nothing new. People have always been like this since the beginning of time. And Jesus says it like this. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, for what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more then raiment, verse number 26. We're going to read all these. Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Read that next line with me. Are ye not much better than they? Stop. Ask yourself that question. Do you believe you hold a special place in God's heart more than the birds of the air? That's a deep question. That's a question we read in the Bible, and we, but that is a deep question. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his statue? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which which today is and tomorrow is cast into an oven, shall he not much more clothe ye? What? O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith that should we, we shall be clothed? Verse number 32. For all of these things do the Gentiles seek. Now for those that don't know what that verse means, 
Gentiles lived with many gods. If you look at the Roman Empire, there was a god for water, there was a god for this, god for that. And in other words, they had to depend on so many different things. So they were always seeking after different gods to provide different things. And what Jesus is saying is they are looking in a thousand different directions for the one answer that they need, and it comes from God. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what? All these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take no thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Worry produces, well, let me say this. Worry is a fruit produced by a root called fear. Has anybody ever had the fear of not enough? Have you ever had the fear of not enough? Do you believe people have that fear? I don't know about you, but the toilet paper section a couple years ago was uh, completely wiped out. People live in this constant fear. Not enough time. Not enough money. Not enough faith. Not enough family. Not enough income. Not enough job. Not enough education. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not small enough. We live in this constant worry of what if it's not enough? What if it's not enough? What if coming here tonight, getting the word of God, what if we go back out there and face something? What if it's not enough? What if we're not going to have enough time tomorrow to do what we need to do or with the people we love? What if we're not going to have enough money to be able to provide? So here's the thing. There are ways you can prevent worry from getting too big. Number one, are y'all ready for this? Somebody say this, pray first. Go to James chapter 5 verse 13. Prayer should be the first response to every situation. And yet we treat it like it is the fire extinguisher behind glass that's always there. But we don't need it until the fire gets here. Prayer is something that I've heard many people say. Well, I guess all we can do now is pray. A doctor's report will come in. I guess all we can do now is pray. Financially, I guess all we can do now is pray. Maybe worry gets so big because we don't know how to pray first. We don't know how to get before God and just pray. James 5.13 says this, is any among you afflicted? Let him what? Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is there any among you afflicted? What? Pray. God knew what world we'd be living in when we'd read this. Is there any among you afflicted? Google WebMD. That's not what it says. Is there anybody in the house guilty of it? I'm guilty. I've went on to WebMD, and by the next day, I was seeing a doctor and thinking the worst. I didn't find this out until I did some research. Have you ever heard that if you give certain symptoms, if one person out of a million gave the symptom you gave and had a certain disease, they have to list that. By law, they have to list it. So out of 100,000 people, if my elbow hurts, most of the time it can be a tore tendon. But one person had their elbow hurt, and it was actually something serious that caused something major wrong with their arm. So boom, that's what you go to. How many know we gravitate to what feeds worry instead of what feeds prayer? We gravitate to opinions more than we do truth. We gravitate towards the things that give us what we think we're looking for and not what God is trying to teach us. Our first response to every situation is pray. Jesus even said this, you've made it a den of thieves and it should be a house of prayer. <laughs> Ain't it amazing that for all those who believe in God, Prayer is not the biggest thing in their life. We feel awkward in prayer. What do we say? What do we do? Let me say this. Prayer 
is coming to God and saying, I don't understand. That's a prayer. Prayer is not this mapped out, you've got to say exactly these words. No. Prayer is your communication to God. Prayer is your honesty with God. Prayer is God's honesty with you. Amen? You know what? Maybe if we would get a life of prayer, and let me say this, once you start developing a strong prayer life, worry starts becoming smaller in your life. Because you've been in, you have been with the Father. He has told you, don't worry about what you're going to put on. Don't worry about that next thing that's going to happen. Don't worry about the things that are falling apart. I'm in control. When you start praying, you start releasing your faith to a faithful God who will always be faithful over you. That's what prayer is. Prayer is getting before God and saying, God, I come to you first. I'm not picking up my phone. I'm not texting nobody. The first place I'm going is you. And I'm praying about it. And then, God, as you lead me through prayer to the people of counsel, to the church services, to the worship, I will go. But, God, the first place I got to go when I get this news is you. You see, the longer we wait to pray, the more we entertain worry. Amen. The more we entertain worry. Number two. This one is tough in the world we live in, but it's true. Go to Psalms 37.7. Somebody say this. Slow down. Slow down. We live life at an unbelievable pace. Let me say it like this. Once you stop rushing through life, you will be amazed of how much more life you have time for. Everything we do, we rush. Everything we do is caused by this great panic, and we don't know how to slow down. The enemy just keeps churning your wheels, churning your schedules, keeping you busy, constantly doing to where you don't appreciate. As I love what, what Jesus teaches them here. Does anybody know to be able to know that the lilies are clothed, you have to stop and look at them? To be able to know the birds are eating, you've got to stop what you're doing and look what he's doing for them. One thing I love about Jesus, think about it. They said, Lazarus is sick. He's going to die. You better get here. He takes two more days in the town that he lives in. Now, you talk about slowing down, right? We would already have picket signs when Jesus showed up. Lazarus is already dead. We told you two days ago. Jesus said, I know my timing. We live, I mean, church is a rush. Everything that we do has got to be time limit. Everything is time watched. Everything that's going on. And we don't know how to enjoy life. And here's what's going to happen, people. Let me give you a wake-up call right now. You're getting older. And one day, you're going to be laying on a bed not able to do the things you can do today. And you are going to have wasted so many days trying to do so much stuff that is not going to follow you to that point. But here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Slow down and let God fight some of the battles you're trying to get ahead of and let God allow you to live the life that he has given you it is a gift from God it is not a chore it is not a job your life is a gift you should treat it that way you should treat it that way people are living at a frantic pace the busier you are the more there is to think about Psalms 37 7 Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers. Slow down. Take time. Do you know what we take for granted every second of our life and very rarely give thanks for it? We don't even take the time to breathe. Well, Lawrence, you don't know my schedule. You don't know what to... Listen, here's what I believe. If you want something bad enough, you'll make time for it. And sometimes you've got to make time just to take a breath and say, wait. You're just pushing yourself to a pay, a pay... Let me say this. If the devil can wear you down, he'll burn you out. And if he'll burn you out, his plan is to burn you up. Amen. 
So you've got to trust God enough to slow down. You've got to trust God enough to say it's time to slow down. It's time to look at the things that I don't look at every single day. That's one reason I love hanging around kids. Kids are amazed at things that we don't even think about anymore. Things that makes a little kid smile. We got, it is proven that when a kid is, is the ages of, of one month to three years old, they can laugh up to 300 times a day. A grown-up will laugh four. Four. And it's because we're living in this pace. They just see everything, and it's new, and it's fresh, and it's beautiful, and they love it. And we are constantly looking. <laughs> when a, I, I'll never forget this. When, when coal started picking back up, the train started running again. And I can remember getting caught by the train. And I'm like, man, I'm going to be late. I'm gonna... And God said, you know what that means? That means somebody's got jobs now. You know what? I waited on that train. I didn't try to find another way around it. I didn't like I normally do. I went, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because somebody's working. Somebody's providing for their family. Do we do that? No. Do, do, look, look at our life. We are so fast-paced people. It's amazing to me that people who live in third world countries laugh and smile and have way less than you have. And it's because they appreciate everything they got and they're, they're not at a pace to try to constantly compete. Let me say this. One of the reasons we rush, whether we want to admit it or not, is we're constantly in a competition, whether it's with other people or with ourselves. As a dad, when you go on a trip, there's only one thing you think about. How quick can I get there? Kids are thinking about, hey, can we stop and get something to eat? Can we? Nope. Mm -mm. And when GPS came out, that was more of a challenge. Because when you enter in your destination that says you'll arrive at 617, you go, I can beat that. I'll beat that. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll go a little faster. We'll cut a little corners. We'll do. And I'll show GPS that I, we're constantly competing, which causes us constant worry because of our pace. Number three, go to Acts chapter 12, verse number five. Somebody say this with me. Act on it. Can I use the words of my main man, Barney Fife? nip it in the bud? Destroy negative thoughts when they first appear. This is when they are at their weakest. We entertain worry way too long. We feed it, we strengthen it, and then wonder why, God, we're going through it. The Bible says, take every thought captive. In other words, God is saying, when it becomes a thought, don't wait till it becomes an action. Take it captive. When it just appears as a thought, take it captive. Cast that negative imagination down. Because let me tell you, if you do not destroy negative thoughts when they first appear, they will only grow stronger and stronger. You have got to realize this is not of God. When you start fearing, say, this is not of God. This is not what God wants me to spend today doing. I, I absolutely call it out in the presence of God. And I say, God, I cast this thought, this imagination, this worry down. Acts 12, 5 says it like this. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But what? Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What did the church do? They prayed without ceasing. They acted on the news they heard. They did not call their neighbors. Guess who got put in prison today? Peter, can you believe that? I can't believe it. Well, I can't either. Well, I better get off here. I got to call somebody else, tell them all about Peter. Peter is in jail. What is the church going to do? What are we going to do? Air preachers in jail. And y'all may have to pray that one day. I don't know. 
the preacher's in jail and what are we going to, you know, they didn't do that. What did they do? Soon as they get the news, they fall on their knees. They act on the negative thoughts because there, there is no way in this world that the devil ain't showing up to the church right now going, well, Peter's gone. Jesus is gone. Everything, see, your whole church keeps falling apart. No, no, no. They captured that thought, fell on their knees and prayed and said, listen, we'll stay here all night if we got to. And the Bible says why the church was praying, why they took the time out of their schedule to pray for somebody else angels showed up at a prison knocked some prison guards out and says Peter you got to get back to church because that's where they're praying for you they didn't they didn't blow up they didn't make it bigger than what it was they they, they didn't make it an impossible task for God they prayed about it they acted upon the news and they nipped it in thank you guys Number four, go to Philippians chapter four, verses 11 through 12. Another reason we worry is because we're not content. If you want to destroy the weapon of worry, learn to be content. I know what some people say when you say the word content. They say, does that mean that we never ask or desire anything? No. To be content doesn't mean you don't desire more. It just means you're thankful for what you have and you're patient for what's to come. That's what that means. It doesn't mean God stops where you are now. God's going to only continue to bless and keep you and show you things that you've always wanted to see. Being content is not saying we can't get more of God. Being content is saying I'm glad where I'm at and I'm patient for what's to come. Philippians 4, 11 through 12 says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith, what? Be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed to be both full and hungry, both to abound and what? Suffer need. Paul says, you know what? I used to hold a pretty major job with the Pharisees. My life was good with the Sadducees. I know what it's like now serving Jesus. I've been thrown in prison a couple of times. I've been snake bit, been shipwrecked, stoned to death. But you know what I've learned? That whatever state I'm in, that whatever I'm going through, I still got what I need. And that's Jesus. You know what I found out? Jesus has brought me out of the shipwrecks. Jesus has brought me out of the prisons. Jesus allowed me to shake off the snake. Jesus allowed me to get up after being stoned to death. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When you know how to be thankful for who you are and what God has done for you and where you are at this point in your life right now, you will find a major breakthrough in worry. We worry so much about the things that may never come to pass. Go to Acts chapter 16, verses 27 through 28. Somebody say this word with me. Say evaluate. Evaluate, evaluate your worry. I'm not going to hide anything from nobody. I've struggled with worry. I've struggled with anxiety. And I see a Christian counselor. Yeah, that's right. Preachers see Christian counselors. My Christian counselor picked up on something that I do often that I never would have known unless somebody neutral would have seen it. He said, Lawrence, he said, if we walk out of this office and you see hoof prints, what do you look for, a horse or a zebra? I said, living in southwest Virginia, I'm looking for a horse. He said, that's exactly right. He said, your problem is, is every time you see hoof prints, you're looking for zebras. You're looking for something that by chance and by most stretch of the imagination is not even there. Evaluate what you're worried about. Put it in perspective. Does anybody know when you start putting things in perspective, worry starts diminishing and faith starts growing? It does. But I think we're all like me sometimes that we look for zebras in a land of horses. Right? 
We look for the worst case scenario. We look for the worst thing that can happen. If this is what's said, then this is what's going to happen next. If this is what it is, listen, my father passed away with cancer. I don't mind to tell you for a long time of my life, every time I hurt, that's what I thought I had. Every pain, that's what it was. Looking for zebras. The chances were slim. But there was enough chance there that I would I would go on a safari in Southwest Virginia. I, I, I'd look for, for exotic animals that did not live here. And it only caused greater worry. Evaluate what you're worried about. Put it in perspective. Realize that sometimes our natural eyes blow things up to make our bodies respond. I want you to know if, if, if we could conquer and allow worry to slow down in our lives, not only would you be healthier, you would be happier. Amen? Amen? Everybody's so worried about being offended. Everybody's so worried about who don't like them. Everybody's so worried about the next thing that's going to come. Everybody's worried about what this person's doing. Everybody's worried about what's happening over there and happening in the, in the governments and the worlds and the kingdoms. And everybody's worried. And evaluate this thing. No matter what's going on there, God's still God over your house. God is still blessing you with breath. God is still giving you strength. And if something by chance does happen, to find you, not only will God give you the strength to deal with it, God will give you the anointing to overcome it. Hallelujah. Why do we stress? Because we evaluate, we don't evaluate through faith. We evaluate, oh, thank you, Jesus. We evaluate through feelings. We don't evaluate through faith. We don't evaluate our worries through faith. We evaluate it through feelings. And that's the easiest thing to do because we are made up of emotions. Acts chapter 16, 27, 28. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword that he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm. What? What? The man's getting ready to take his life because he is fearing the worst thing that can happen. And Paul reminds him, wait a second, look. None of us have left. You think you know what we're going to do and you have no idea. They say 95% of most people's stress is because people won't act the way you want them to act. Oh, glory. Can I tell you right now, you'll never control people. You'll never control them no matter what you do. You, you can guilt trip them. You can do whatever you want, but you will never control people. Paul says, you're assuming the worst, so you're acting the worst. We're still here. Do you know what happened to that jailer? Thank God I got to be at the river where they supposedly took place when I went to Rome. They baptized him and his family. How did it happen when they evaluated what he was worried about and then realized there was nothing to worry about? Evaluate it. Put it in God's hands. Number six. Go to Psalms chapter 42 verse 11. Say this with me. Focus on today. Please don't let yesterday or tomorrow take up too much room for today. Don't. You're never going to get another day just like this one, ever. You're never going to have a moment just like this one, ever. Ever. You're never going to have this day, this moment, exactly this way ever again. And we're too busy worried about tomorrow. We're too busy thinking about the, 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 the things that we messed up yesterday. Focus on today. For why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and what? My God. Why are you worried about yesterday? It's gone. Why are you worried about tomorrow? It's not here. The Bible said that today is a gift, that this is what God says about today, that today is something we rejoice about, not when it's over, not when it's through. Focus on the moment you got right now. Because if you don't, then you just lost a day. And you don't get it back. So why fill up today with tomorrow and yesterday? Did not Jesus say tomorrow will take care of itself? 
and yesterday is already taken care of. Focus on the moment you're in today. Learn how to be content today. Learn how to evaluate worry today. Evaluate the slowdown process of your life. Learn to pray first. Do these things so that worry is not a weapon against you. Number seven. Go to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Understand God's way is not your way. Has anybody ever questioned God? Why am I here? Why is this situation happening to me? Why? Why am I dealing with what I'm dealing with? Why? Anybody ever asked that question? Sometimes the only way God can show us he is in control is to put us in situations we can't control. Right? I believe that with all my heart. Sometimes God has to put us in situations we can't control so we can know he's in control. Because as long as we're in control, we're going to grab the wheel. We're going to hold on to it. We're going we're, we're gonna... to. Lauren was driving me the other day and we were coming to a stop sign. And I did that. And she went, what? I was going to stop. And I said, you wasn't stopping when I would have stopped. It's not that she did wrong. She stopped. She didn't stop when I thought she should stop. Am I the only person that acts like that when your teenager drive? Y'all going to make me feel bad up in this place. No dashboard grabbers? No old Jesus? She said, what are you so stressed about? I was like, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's going through your head. So I'm going, she ain't going to stop. See, she said, just relax. That's hard to do. But now I'm trying to. I'm trying to take breaths because my worry spills over into her to where now she's extra cautious. So unless she actually runs through the stop sign, I'll scream. <laughs> now when I'm wanting to hit the floor, I change it up and go, if you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. <laughs> I was like, we got to turn a positive to this thing. You know what I'm saying? That way she don't think I'm stomping. I'm still stomping and God's getting the praise. Glory to God. Isn't that awesome? Understand God's way is not your way. Isaiah 50, 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You've got to understand sometimes you just got to let God be in control, even when you don't know what he's going to do next, and even if it's not what you wanted him to do next, because his plan is perfect. It's so amazing. It's so well orchestrated. Every thought that he has towards you is good and not evil. All things work to the good for them that love the Lord according to his purpose. He is orchestrating it out. And here's the thing. He's never going to ask for your advice if it's good enough. How many know he don't want your advice? He wants your faith to say, you know what? This ain't exactly what I would have done. But I do believe it's what he does. And I believe it's good. This is one of my, my new quotes that I hang on to. In the end, everything's going to be okay. And if it's not okay, that means it's not the end. I tell myself that often. If it's not okay, good. That means it's not the end, so I'm okay. Because in the end, does anybody believe in the end it's going to be okay? God knows how to finish what he starts. Isn't that what his word says? He declares the end from the beginning. He is the alpha, the omega, the problem is we trust him with the process. I'm glad he didn't ask us how to create the world. We'd have created everything out of sync. We'd have wanted to create us first, but if there was nothing to eat, nothing to drink, we'd have died. Everything about creation was a perfect orchestrated plan. And the same thing, if God knew how to put nature in order, how much does he know how to put your life in order? Right? Number eight. Last one, and you don't have to worry that I'll go any longer. We just wiped that worry out. <laughs> Psalms 42, 1. And this has been a theme this year, not just tonight's message. This has been something I think God is truly trying to get across to the church. 
to his children, to you. Let God be enough. No matter what you're going through, just let God be enough. Tell him that. God, you're enough. God, having you is the best thing I've ever had in my life. It's the truly only needful thing that I need. When is he enough? We have gotten so catered to by this world. This world has known how to make us happy, but it can't give you joy. This world knows how to make things easier, but it can't give you strength. This world knows how to make things go faster, but it can't give you time. This world can give you the best mattresses in the world, but it can't give you sleep. This world can make some of the greatest foods you've ever smelled, but it can't give you an appetite. Anybody get what I'm saying? This world can give you the greatest church service in the world where the singing is on point, the preaching is outstanding, but it can't give you the anointing. When is God enough? When is just sitting with God enough? You know, maybe we would worry less if we could proclaim this every day, God, I'm going to wake up this morning and I'm going to go ahead and declare it, decree it over my day, over my job, over my family. You're enough. And no matter what happens on my job and my family and my day, I'm going to say it again. You're enough. And if it all starts falling apart, I'm going to lift my voice and say, you're enough. And when people that I love start going through tough times, I'm going to say, God, you're enough. You're no respecter of persons. If you're enough for me, you're enough for them. God, I, I just was given a terrible report. That's okay, God, you're enough. When is God enough? When he does more for us? Is that when God's enough? No. When we fall in love with who God is more than what God does, you have reached a major threshold in your faith because now you don't always have to look for something to believe God is there because your faith is already declared. He will never leave me or forsake me. I don't seem, I don't feel him, but guess what? He's enough. He's enough. You know what I found out? The people who make money and are addicted to rich can't never be rich enough. The people who are very smart can't be smart enough. They're constantly trying to fill a hole. People who've gotten high can't get high enough. People who get drunk can't get drunk enough. People who are addicted to relationships can't get enough one night stands. I'm going to preach right now. This world is constantly trying to fill itself and it is finding out daily it is not enough. It's not. They can keep giving us money. It'll never be enough. They can keep taking money. It'll never be enough. <laughs> when is it enough? Here's when you will enjoy life at its fullest. Not when you can look and say everything around me is full, but when you can look within you and say I am full. That's when you will enjoy life. That's the reason in Habakkuk it says that the fields were empty. It says the stalls were empty. The trees were empty. The barnyards, the, 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 the cellars, everything around us was completely wiped out. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord God of my salvation. Because even when there's nothing in the stall, he's still in my heart. And as long as he is with me, he is enough. Mike, as you guys go ahead and make your way up here. The weapon of worry is destroying people's lives left and right. I'm not here to tell you that this message will prevent worry, but it will prevent it from getting too big. But Lawrence, what if worry is too big? That's okay. God knows how to bring down giants too. But don't keep feeding them if you know they're going to be giants. This fear of not enough, this fear of not enough time, not enough money. Do I have enough faith? I don't know how much time you got left on this earth. I don't know how much time I got left. But I know this, I got today. And you know what? I'm thankful for it. And you know what? It's okay to slow down every once in a while and look at a sunset and go, God, you're great. Every once in a while, it's okay to hold your 
grandchild, even your children, no matter how old they are, just grab them and hug them and just say, it's just good to hold you. It's okay. It's okay to stop. They may think you're crazy. That's all right. That ain't going to be the first time they thought it, and it won't be the last. Stop somebody and shake their hand and say, thank you for being my friend today. When's the last time you told somebody, thank you for being my friend? Ask yourself that question. When's the last time you truly embraced somebody and said, thank you for being my friend? I may never told you, but thank you for being my friend. We're going too fast. That's the reason we feel alone. When we start worrying, we start saying, God, is there anybody that feels like me? God, is there anybody else going through? Even Elijah said, the reason I'm in this cave wanting to die is because I'm the only one left. And God says, there's 7,000 people living like you. Maybe it's because you're running from Jezebel. You're running from everything. And you're not realizing the people that I put around you. Maybe worry keeps getting so big and big in this world because our faith starts getting so small in this world. I don't want just the faith that says, I'll soon be done with troubles and trials. I want the faith that says, yes, I do believe I'll soon be done with troubles and trials. But I also want the faith that says, while I'm still in troubles and trials, my God's good enough, big enough, and thank God I'm blessed to have it. That video, I wished I could show you. If I had my phone or if I could download it, I'm going to show you all one day because I know he won't mind. Going across Cane Break Mountain. I do want you to picture this for a minute. Close your eyes and never open them. And let me take you across two mountains of curves, left and right, and you cannot see what's coming next. And Chris was sick. I knew he was sick because he stopped talking. And we started playing the champion. He laid that seat back. He'd sing that song and he'd point to himself, you are my champion. I'm crowned with confidence. He would act out every word. He had no idea I was filming him, none. But I had my phone like this because I thought, God, here we are with all the senses that we've been blessed with. We're complaining about traffic that's in front of us. We're complaining about potholes we hit. And this man has no idea where he's even going. He's not going to see the church that he goes in. He's not going to see the people he's going to go to church with. And yet he is singing, you are my champion. And I go, my goodness, God, please let me slow down to realize everything that you have given me. Lawrence, my eyes only see evil. Well, that's what you're looking for because they're still good to look at. God, my ears only hear bad news, and that means what you're listening for because they're still good news. My body only feels pain. Well, guess what? If you're feeling pain, that means you're here. I know it ain't easy, but man, thank you, God. All things be thankful. This is the will of God concerning Jesus. This message is not going to stop worry because we're human. But I don't know about you. I want it to slow down. I want to know how to use the word of God to say you can only come this far, right? The tides still come, but there's still a limit to how far they can come. Does anybody want to say, you know what, devil? Worry has a limit. God's already drawn the line through the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can only come this far. Tonight, think about those things in life. Yeah, it's not one of those cartwheel, let's get it pumped up service, but I'm going to tell you what, this is one of the messages that changed your everyday life. Because worry is something you deal with every single day. Every single day. Learn to pray first, not worry first. Learn to slow down instead of speed up. Worry makes you want to get to another day. Like, okay, this day is so bad, just get me tomorrow. Worry tells you, just sweep it under the rug. Worry tells you there could be more. Worry tells you that it's bigger than what it is. Worry tells you tomorrow is more more important than today. And yesterday is so full of failure that you can't enjoy. Worry tells you God don't know what he's doing and he's forgotten and left you. I I sung every word with Charlotte because that is a song that I have just clung to. I love that song. I will rescue you. 
Worry will tell you God's not enough. But faith, faith says pray first. Faith says slow down. Faith says act on it. Faith says be content. Faith says evaluate it. Get a new perspective about it. Faith says enjoy today. Faith says God's ways are greater so it's going to work out okay. And faith says God is enough. So tonight as you stand to your feet. I want to 